Tomorrow, we celebrate America's independence. Ours is a nation to be thankful for, a nation for which so many have sacrificed time, and blood, and even their own lives. But our nation is also one that needs to refocus on our desperate dependence on God. We need Him to open the heavens and pour out His Spirit. Today, however, this is a house of worship, an embassy for God's kingdom, where we express allegiance to a higher authority who saves us by His grace. And we call out to Him for mercy, both here and around the world. Because throughout all of history and the future yet unseen, He is faithful, He is strong, He is with us, and His love endures forever. Central Assembly, let's stand to our feet and worship together, whether you're here in person or online. Let's sing together. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. hand in an outstretched arm. His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Come on, lift it together. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing it with me. His love. His love endures forever. Yes, His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Yes, His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise.
Calvin Noel with us this morning to lead worship with us. Let's enter our hearts today as we continue to sing. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again.
just need to come. You may be seated. We've worshiped God for his faithfulness, his strength, and his unending love for us. Yet that didn't come without a cost. Before we invite him to pour out his presence and his spirit into our personal lives, our church, our community, and our nation, we take time to remember Christ's redeeming work on the cross. Paul told the Corinthians, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. So let us now honor his gift of sacrificial love by examining ourselves and repenting of anything that may be standing in the way of a right relationship with Christ. We thank you, Lord, for your abundant forgiveness purchased for us when you died at the cross, when your body was broken and your blood was shed. Thank you, Lord. We're so unworthy, but we thank you. You took us, washed us clean when we put our faith in you. And we pray that if that moment has not come for some of us yet, this will be that moment simply turning from our sin, repenting, seeking your forgiveness based on what you have done for us, not what we've done for you. And we honor you in this house today. We thank you for your presence. We thank you as we come to your table now to remember your death and your resurrection. We thank you that you, the living Christ, are among us. Meet us here at this table, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to ask you to reach. I hope you were able to find a communion emblems as you came in in uh, the packaging here. We've upgraded the packaging, <laughs> as you've noticed. And it won't fit into the little communion cup holders, but it will fit in, in, in the, book, uh, the uh, bookshelves in front of you later. But I'd like you just to take the bread and hold it in your hand for a moment. When, I, when our founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence, they knew they were signing quite possibly their death sentence. And some of them paid for our freedom with their lives. But the night before Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and cup and, 
And he talked about the death sentence on his life the next day for, for our freedom, for our forgiveness, for our life, for our thriving as human beings, for our glorifying of God while we're alive on this earth. And that night he, he took bread, it said, and he broke the bread. And he said, take heed, this is my body which is broken for you. And those two words, for you, always drill into my heart with the amazing love of God. He did this, not for himself, he did this for us so that we could be free, so that we could know a relationship with him. In fact, the Bible says that this was in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy who said, by his wounds we are healed. <laughs> thank God for that. So Lord, we thank you for the bread. We thank you for dying for our freedom, for our healing. Take the broken parts of our lives, we pray, and restore them. Thank you. This is what you do, Lord Jesus. And we praise you and we honor you for dying in our place. And on this Independence Weekend, we thank you for, first of all, the independence that you have given to us because you died in our place. Thank you, Lord. And live to make us new today. Let's take the bread with thanksgiving in our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just let his healing come right now. Let his restoring work wherever you need it. Let it come as we sit in his presence. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we are healed. Thank you. And take the cup. You can tear off the top flap. Just hold it. As we remember Jesus also, after he took bread, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant that's a relationship word. The new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you take it in remembrance of me until the day I come again. And so, Lord, we thank you for the blood of Jesus shed for us to guarantee a new relationship with you based on your faithfulness. Lord, where our sins would be washed away by your blood, where you would, you would oh God, qualify us to share in your presence and to be filled with your spirit because of your blood shed. And Lord, we do, as we have already prayed prayers of repentance, we, we do say if there's any unconfessed sin in our lives, we ask you to forgive us. If there's any attitudes we're holding towards others that are not of you, Lord, that are of, of unforgiveness and resentment, we pray you'll wash our heart of those things as we, we choose to forgive others as you have forgiven us. And in your name, we take the cup with joy, with thanksgiving, and with your grace upon us. Thank you, Lord, so that your spirit might breathe upon us in new ways, that you will fill us by your spirit. Thank you for making it possible by your shed blood. Let's take the cup together. Hallelujah. I just wanted to say something this morning before we go into this next song. It's an honor and privilege to be with you today. And I just want to share something that I felt the Lord put on my heart about a month ago. I was leading worship in Dallas, Texas. And the night before I went to bed, and during the middle of the night, I woke up and my, both of my knees were burning. And I didn't know what that was. That was kind of weird for me. And I went to service that next morning, and I was in the front row. And I just kept asking God, like, God, show me, please tell me what this means. Why are my knees burning? And just out of nowhere, the Lord gave me a word for the people there, which I think is appropriate for where we are today. He said, Calvin, I want you to go out there and tell the people that Romans 14, 11, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in that moment, I just kept feeling from the Holy Spirit that people don't bow in this season. We want to be right. 
And I always say any strength over, overused is a weakness. And I just told the Lord in that moment, whatever it is, I plan to bow my heart. And I just pray today that we are desperate for the presence of the Lord. And that we learn how to bow in his presence and to bow to him and surrender to his lordship. Amen.
Here's our desperate plea today as that word said. He's calling us and he loves us and longs to answer our plea, longs to answer our prayers today. So as we continue to sing this morning, this next prayer, this next song, it's for to let it rain over his church, over this city, over his people, to pour out his blessing, to pour out the floodgates, to open them over us, God. Let's make that our prayer, our desire today, God.
so much that needs God's divine intervention from political bickering, racial divides, violence, broken families, and godlessness. It's easy to feel hopeless, but we must remember that God is all powerful and all knowing. His ways are not our own, and we trust ultimately in a plan he has for our nation and all of humanity. The fix for a world with such difficulties isn't found in organized human events protests, rallies, conventions, or political parties is found in each of us willingly giving him our lives and seeking him daily in prayer and looking for opportunities to show his love to others in ways that point back to him. So God, today we commit to giving you room in our lives to work your redeeming power. We give you room to work in our relationships with one another, room to work in our families, in our brokenness, in our suffering and need. And God, yes, we invite you into our church, in our community, and this lost and struggling nation. God, we trust in the teaching of your word and in the guidance of your Holy Spirit. So God, pour out that spirit right now today and let it rain in this place. Come on, church. Jews, the living church, just lift your voices to him. Lord, we're here to call out on behalf of our families, of our cities, of our nation, on behalf of our world, oh God, let your spirit reign in fresh ways upon us. Lord, you're all we need, we all, you're all we've ever longed for. We're desperate for you, and we pray for the reign of heaven. We pray, oh God, for a spiritual awakening in America, Lord, from coast to coast, border to border, up into Canada, down into Mexico, Alaska, Hawaii. My God, pour out your spirit again in a way that, that will shake our world, we pray. Oh God, let it rain in our lives. Wash away all the substitutes. Forgive us, Lord, for all the distractions and forgive us our apathy. And we pray that your spirit in power will be poured out on your living church, O oh God, 
that we will see you move across our nation, break the back of drug addiction and pornography and sexual sin and break the back, O oh God, of materialism and false gods. And we pray, O oh God, you'll break the back of crime and destruction and violence in our culture. We pray, O oh God, you will bring righteousness. You will reveal Jesus, O oh God. Lord, that there will be a great turning to you. We pray churches that are discouraged will be lifted up. You'll pour your spirit upon them in a fresh way. We pray, O oh God, in every city and every county there will be living healthy churches that will proclaim your name, that will pray for the sick and they shall be healed, that will preach the gospel and people will be saved, that will do good works in, in their cities and in their towns to glorify you and meet the needs of people. We pray, oh God, that you will bring a turnaround in our nation in the name of Jesus, we pray. Where 85% of our country right now feels we're going in the wrong direction, whatever that may mean to them, we pray that you will send a spiritual awakening. Let it rain in our nation again, we pray. Let the power of your spirit come. Do what we cannot do, Lord. Uh, take your church as crippled as we may feel at times and raise us up to your glory, O oh God, uh, to, to the hope of the nations, you, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Open the windows of heaven. Let it rain again. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. And we praise you, Lord. We thank you that you are King of kings. You're King of all the kings. You're Lord of all the lords. Thank you that day is indeed coming where every knee will bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. Hallelujah. So we're here as your living church to call out to you today to work in the land, to work in our families, to work in our lives. For we, oh God, set our focus on you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Praise your name. Can you say amen to that? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Thank God for his living presence with us. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Perhaps would you just express our, your appreciation to Calvin Noel and our orchestra, our choir, who have helped us today. And it's so good to be with you. Um, they say, I heard yesterday that they estimate half of the American population is traveling this weekend. That probably means half of our congregation is gone. But that also means that some of you are traveling and you have come to visit us, and we're grateful. I believe Craig and Tricia Cunningham are with us. Uh, they pastor in Southern California. They used to be our youth pastors here and connection pastor. We love them. Are you here? Just wave at me uh, if I can see. There you are back there. We love you guys. Wonderful to have you back. Had a chance to preach in their church, uh, amazing church they built in Southern California a few years ago. I was with them. And it's good to have every one of you, all of those of you online joining with us. Thank you for being a part of this day. i like, as we come to God's Word, I'd like you to turn with me, take your notes or the screen or your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 2. If you're 40 years old, uh, you have lived just long enough to know that in 40 years, a lot can go right and a lot can go wrong. <laughs> it's about that much time. Well, about 40 years after the Apostle Paul started a church in the world-class city of Ephesus, about 40 years later, Christ, from heaven, sent a message, a personalized message to that church in Ephesus. It was about 40 years old at this point. I wonder if Jesus sent Central Assembly a personalized message. I wonder if Jesus was to talk out loud to the church in America today. I wonder what he'd say. Well, I think it would be similar to what, what Jesus said to that Ephesian church that bears so many similarities, that city, to our nation today. He says in verse 2 of Revelation 2, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. 
I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So in those 40 years, a lot had gone well. Yet verse 4, I I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You've forsaken your first love. You no longer sing, sing songs like, I'm desperate for you. You're all I need. You've left your first love. And then verse 5, our marching orders, consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If I could paraphrase that verse in three words, it's, it's, it would be the three words, refocus. You've left your first love, so, so you need to refocus on your first love again. And then repent. Remember how far you've fallen and repent. And then return. Go and do the first things that you did. Go back to what you did at first. Refocus. Repent and return. Let's just walk through those three words this morning. First of all, refocus. Refocus on what? How great a church we are? How much we have in America? Mm -mm. We need to go back to refocusing on the one who truly needs to be our first love, and that's Jesus. Let me tell you, before it's wonderful worship songs and great choirs and orchestras and praise bands, it's Jesus. Before it's inspiring sermons and favorite podcasters, it's Jesus. Before it's church programs and church buildings, that we may love, it's Jesus that we love more. And I'm going to mess with you here now before it's donuts and coffee in the lobby and lunch after church with your friends. It's Jesus. We love him more than any other of those things because he is all we need, as we powerfully sang this morning. It's Jesus. And that's why what Paul writes in Colossians 3 is so incredibly important. Verse 1, since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your heart on worship songs, no. Set your heart on your favorite speakers, no. He said, set your heart on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. My friend, Dr. Gary Tyra, in his wonderfully inspiring book, Christ's Empowering Presence, he talks about how revolutionary Colossians 3 became in his life. He writes, at the heart of many of the approaches to Christian spirituality that have been offered over the years is the idea that it's possible to learn to live moment by moment in the felt presence of the resurrected and ascended Christ. It's possible to approach all the events in the course of a day with a sense that we're not alone, that Christ is right there with us, loving us, encouraging us, enabling us to respond to this or that situation or person the way he would. The life-altering concept of Christ's empowering presence Now, my friend, Dr. Tyra, was a pastor and a professor, and he said, when I began to discover first love again, when I began to discover Colossians 3, setting my life and whole attention moment by moment on Jesus, he said, it was at a time in my life when words like this described me. He said there were words like hurry and stress and anxiety and frustration and impatience and melancholy. Those words, even though I was a pastor, even though I was trying so hard to live for Jesus, those were the words to describe me. And that's, that's how many of us, you know, we start with Jesus, but, but he no longer is our first love and we're focused on everything else. We even get focused on our busyness and, our, and that pressure to perform out of all the right intentions. 
Our Christian lives become just checking off the boxes and striving and probably low-level guilt all the time that we're never that we're never matching up. It's time to refocus on Jesus. My friend, Dr. Tyrus, said my life began to change when I just began to refocus on Jesus. As Gail Johnson has written, she said, striving and pushing and shoving will never bring life to your soul ever, but Jesus will. It's just refocusing on him. He said, I have this against you, Jesus said to this church, that you don't just focus on me all the time anymore. As Von Parrish said, in many of our churches, Jesus is still the commercial, but he's no longer the main event. And so no wonder he says, consider how far you've fallen and repent. Repent. Repentance has to do with our sin. What do we repent of? We repent of all sin in our lives. It's the game changer word. And it grates It grates in a kind of uncomfortable way against our contemporary ears. Most people you will work with this week probably do not have the word repentance even in their vocabulary. And a lot of churches are trying to distance themselves from this word because it feels offensive. And it is offensive, first of all, for for two reasons. First of all, because it's honest. It's an honest word. Repentance means you're not allowed to be a hypocrite. You can't fake it any longer. Repentance means you got to come clean and be honest about what is really going on in your life and heart. I think honesty is one of the hardest things about being a Christian for me. It's, it's that abject honesty. I, I want to live in denial. I, I want to point the finger and blame other people. But God's spirit always brings me back to honesty. And then out of that honesty, I find that this word is very humbling because it it brings me to the place where I have to admit that my way was wrong and God's way was right after all. And that's humbling to admit you're wrong. It's humbling to say, God, I blew it. You were right all along. And yet repentance will bring you back to that place. David, after in that great psalm of repentance, Psalm 51, where he had committed adultery and then committed murder, and he's repenting in this psalm. And and he says, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. I mean, when we're flaunting our credentials, when when our self-esteem has become more important than God's esteem, I want to tell you, we block off the grace of God. But repentance brings us to honesty and to humility. We can't be hypocrites anymore. we got to be the real deal in it all. And we, in humility, realize that in our brokenness, He meets us with His fullness. He dwells with the humble. And so, perhaps, in talking about the lead-up to that realization in his life, David writes in Psalm 32, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. We've been feeling the heat of summer this week, and it's going to get worse next week, sorry to tell you that. My irrigation system is not working right now. And where you don't have water, everything dies. So I've been praying, let it rain in more ways than one. (laughs) And we know what it is to be sapped by the heat of summer. And he said, that's with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God calling me to that place of humility and honesty again. He said, God was working on me. And and, and your, your hand was heavy on me. And my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Can I hear a praise God somewhere in this house? He forgave the guilt of my sin. That's why Peter could preach in Acts 3, verse 19, repent then, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. It's an honest word. It's a humbling word. It's it's a hard word, repent. But it's the door opener to the reign of heaven and the grace of God. He's saying, you've lost your first love. You need to refocus on Jesus. 
And you need to repent on all the, of all that Jesus substitutes in your life. And the reign of heaven is going to come. That's why Frank Bartleman, who was so central to the Azusa Street Revival 115 years ago, which, which was where Central Assembly ultimately came from, he said the depth of revival will be determined exactly by the depth of the spirit of repentance. God, help us, help us, Lord, help us. You've forsaken your first love. You need to refocus on Jesus. So consider how far you've fallen and repent. And then Jesus said to the Ephesian church, and do the things you did at first. You need to return to what you were and what you did at first. And I think for that, for us in America, Jesus would say to his church, I just want you to return to being the people of God. And I almost, I almost titled that point, return to being unashamed to be the people of God. Because our culture is making it increasingly embarrassing to be a full of Jesus, spirit-filled Christian these days. In the epistle to Diognetus, it was written maybe as early as 40 years after Jesus spoke to the Ephesian church in the early part of the uh, second century. Um, we don't know who Diognetus was except that he's referred to as your excellency. So it was a writer trying to explain to a ruler about this phenomenon of the spread of the Christian church. And uh, Diognetus writes this, for the Christians are distinguished from other men neither by country nor language nor the customs which they serve, observe, but inhabiting Greek as well as barbarian cities according as the lot of each of them has determined and following the customs of the natives in respect to clothing, food, and the rest of their ordinary conduct, they display to us their wonderful and confessedly striking method of life. So he's saying they dress like everybody else. They follow the general customs of their country. They drive, it was today, he'd say, they drive the same kind of cars as all the rest of us. But there is something strikingly different about their way of life, these Christians. And he goes on to explain, they marry as do all others. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. Here's where the battle lines are being drawn around our understanding of sexual morality and, and life and the sanctity of life. Those same battle lines are being drawn today in our nation. And so they beget children, but they don't destroy their offspring, either in the womb or out of the womb. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. I'm so grateful to be a citizen of the United States. But above all else, I'm a citizen of heaven because of Jesus. And they obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. What an impact the early Christian church made on their world. And I just thought I'd have a little fun with you because there's so much in our culture to make us embarrassed about being religious these days, let alone Christians. And Mike, Mike Clark writes, I want to turn this idea of thinking again, which he'd been writing about, and aim it at an idea so rooted in the post-Christian West that I'm sure it will mess with our brains a little. It's the idea that religion is good or perhaps great for society as a whole. You know, thank God, I think Jesus is calling us just to be the church again, just to be his people again. And you know what? You don't have to hang your head in shame. In fact, in this article, he goes on and cites 247 studies done between 1944 and the year 2010. 247 different sociological studies that showed that people of faith um, affect society in such a positive way that it diminishes crime, deviance, and delinquency. That's what faith can do. 
He says people of faith are for, far more likely to donate their money and time to socially beneficial programs and be active in civic affairs. I tell you, you, you can go on and on about social justice and thank God for it. But if you never give your time or money away, it, you're a hypocrite. You know, it's like saying someone else be socially just, but I'm not going to roll up my sleeves. But this is what people of faith tend to do. They are deemed happier, less neurotic, far less likely to commit suicide. And get this, they have an average life expectancy more than seven years longer than that of people who have no faith. Gives new meaning to live long and prosper. <laughs> people of faith, these... All these studies have shown tend to, tend to be more apt to marry, less likely to divorce, report higher degrees of satisfaction with their spouse. Religious husbands are far less likely to abuse their wives or children, unlike what it's made out to be today. Religious fathers are much more likely to be involved in youth-related activities, such as coaching sports teams or leading scout troops. Religious students, get this, if you're a student, religious students perform, on average, better on standardized achievement tests. They're far less likely to drop out of school, to obtain uh, better jobs upon graduation, are far less likely to be on the unemployment rolls. Thank God. People of faith, listen, uh, our culture is... Uh, making you feel more and more ashamed of being people of faith, but it's good for you to be a person of faith. So let's be happy that we get to be the people of God. <laughs> then add Jesus at the center, and we can transform society. That's why I think God, when God calls us to return, he's calling us not only to return to being the people of God in all that we ought to be, but he's teaching us to return to doing good works as the church. Back to the epistle to Diognetus. To, he says, to sum it up all in one word, what the soul is in the body, that Christians are in the world. <laughs> what the soul is to body, that's what Christians are to the world. Tertullian, he was a scholar who lived in the second into the third century, a church scholar. He was the one who first came up with the idea of Trinity to describe uh, as a title for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He describes their church gatherings this way. We meet together as an assembly, because here's where I think our good works begin. We meet together as an assembly and congregation that offering up prayer to God as a united force, we may wrestle with him in our supplications. He says, this is partly why we gather as a church, so that we can wrestle with God in prayer for the world we live in. I'll tell you, there's a few things I love more than when we lift our voices as a congregation in prayer. Like Acts 4, they lifted their voices to the Lord and said, oh God, you have made sovereign God, you've made the heavens and the earth, and we need you. And he said, we, we, we do this And uh, we pray too. We said, first of all, this strong exertion, God delights in. He delights when we come together on behalf of the world around us, when we exert ourselves to struggle with God in prayer for his breakthrough in the world around us. So we pray too for the emperors, for their ministers, and for all in authority, for the welfare of the world, for the prevalence of peace, for the delay of the final consummation. We pray for mercy on our world. We pray for our leaders. We pray, we wrestle with God for the good of society around us. I think that's where our good works start. And then in another first century work called the Apology of Aristides, an apology doesn't mean here saying you're sorry. Apology here means an intellectual defense of the faith. And he's writing to the Roman Emperor Hadrian trying to explain the phenomenon of the early church. And this would easily be within 30 to 40 years of when Jesus spoke to the Ephesian church. He says, they abstain from all impurity in the hope of the recompense that is to come in another world. As for their servants or handmaidens or children, they persuade them to become Christians by the love they have for them. And when they become so, when they become Christians, they call them without distinction brothers. Doesn't matter if they're a servant, a handmaid, a child. We're all equal. We're all brothers. 
They do not worship strange gods, and they walk in all humility and kindness, and falsehood is not found among them, and they love one another. When they see the stranger, they bring him into their homes and rejoice over him as over a true brother. For they do not call those who are after the flesh, but those who are in the spirit and in God. And if there is among them a man that is poor and needy, and and if they have not an abundance of necessities, they fast two or three days that they may supply the needy with necessary food. This is what Christians are like. If they find someone hungry and they don't have extra food, they will, they will go without food for two or three days so that they can give it to somebody else who does have a need. I want to tell you the love of God shown through us in good works to our world, so transforming. That's why Paul writes to Titus in the New Testament. In Titus chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Remind the people in the church there to be subject to rulers and authorities to be obedient, and to be ready to do whatever is good. Whatever is good, be ready to do it. And to slander no one. And to be peaceable and considerate. And always to be gentle towards everyone. It does not sound like social media some days. It grieves me to see followers of Jesus just being very nasty. Just tearing people apart. The ethic of the early Christian church, the thing we need to return to, was they were people of good works. He says, be ready. Tell Titus, tell him to be ready to do everything was good and don't slander people and be peaceable and considerate, always gentle towards everyone. And then in the next few verses, Paul will go on in Titus chapter 3 to remind them, I think of the third thing, God calls us to respond, to return to. He calls us to return to just unapologetically being the people of God. He calls us to return to doing good works to change our world. And most of all, to really change our world, he calls us to proclaiming the good news. Because he goes immediately to describing good news. He says in the next verse, verse 3, at one time we too were foolish We were disobedient. One time met before Christ, before we had a life encountering change with Christ. Not before we just volunteered at the food pantry. But he's going even deeper than good works. He said before Jesus changed our lives. We were foolish, we were disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another, as so many people do today. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit who he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior so that having been justified by his grace we might become heirs having the hope not just of this life but of eternal life. That my friends is the good news. That's what gospel means. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to return, not not just to being the people of God, not just to doing good works, but we, we need to return to proclaiming that news to our world, the gospel. Look, there's nothing like it in any other religious system. Let's look at verses 4 and 5 again. He saved us, not because of righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. You can't do a, a thing to deserve The fact that God loved you and he died in your place at the cross and he wants to give you his mercy. And good deeds ought to fill your life. That's partly how we witness to our world by doing good deeds and serving the poor and the hungry and the needy in our world. But it starts starts with Jesus showing mercy to us 
And in that mercy, he changed us. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's not just believing the right things. It's Jesus. That's why we pray, let it rain. Lord, by your Spirit, come. May your Spirit touch people's lives. May they put their faith in you. May they be born again. May, may they be renewed inside out by the Holy Spirit so that having been justified by his grace, we become heirs having the hope of eternal life. There's many uh, studies are indicating that in churches like ours, um, there's a, a surprisingly large percentage of people who now believe that to share your faith with somebody else is politically incorrect. It's inappropriate to evangelize other people. That's become a very bad word. But I want to tell you, I, I want to serve. I want to volunteer. I want to do good works. I want to be the man of God I ought to be. I want to be a part of the church that, that is truly being the people of God and doing good works. But no life is ultimately changed without the power of Jesus making them new from the inside out. And if we love people, we're going to share the good news with them. So Revelation 2, verse 5, because they left their first love, God calls them to refocus. Refocus on Jesus. And then consider how far you've fallen and repent. Repent. And then do the things you did at first, being the people of God, doing good works as the church of Jesus Christ ought to, and proclaiming the good news. Would you stand with me? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're going to be closing with a song. It's so wonderful to be with you on this weekend. May we hear Jesus saying to his church, refocus and repent and return. And may we say yes. Amen. So our heads bow just for a moment. You're here and... Uh, you, you, you maybe need to repent. Your life's not right with God. and You need to refocus your whole life on Jesus. And, uh, or maybe you did it one time in your life, but you need to return to that again. I'm just going to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I'm just going to pray for you for a moment. But as I look across this congregation, if you just want to wave your hand at me and say, Pastor Jim, include me in that prayer. I, I need... I need to repent today. I need to return to him. I, I need to refocus on Jesus in my life, and I need help with that. You just wave your hand at me. Uh, just I want you to acknowledge that's so important to acknowledge. Remember, repentance, it means it requires honesty on our part. And you just honestly say, yes, Lord, I need Jesus today. Thank you. Lord Jesus, you see our hearts. You see our lives. You see our great need of you. And we thank you that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. There is no one like you in heaven or in earth. And we just pray, oh God, for all of us who, who just need to refocus on you. Maybe our lives have just become full of striving and things that really aren't bringing life to us. You are the one who brings life. Just help us. To begin every moment of the day just paying attention to you, just living in your presence. And Lord, where there's sin in our lives, we repent. We ask you to forgive our sin right now in Jesus' name. Lord, there's no revival without repentance. There's no season of refreshing without repentance. And my God, help us not to be tolerant of sin. Help us to be honest about it and humble and help us to turn from it and call upon you for forgiveness. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you'll help us to return to the things we did at first, perhaps, when we did have hearts alive for you, and return to all the things that we ought to be as a church, to be your people and to do good works and to proclaim the gospel. My God, help us on this Independence Day weekend, for the sake of our nation, help us to return to those things to being your people and doing good works and proclaiming the gospel. And we pray again that your spirit will breathe upon our land and upon our nation. And we thank you for it. Hallelujah.
Hear us now, Lord, as we sing this closing prayer to you. In Jesus' name. and burn with holy 
say, say, pour your healing out. 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 God, we need a fresh wind, a fragrance from heaven. God, pour your spirit out. God, pour your spirit out. It's a holy anointing and the power of your presence. God, pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out. We're here for that, Lord. Your spirit, your grace. Thank you. We can be your people. Thank you for your spirit to make us alive. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hear our prayer today. Thank you, Jesus. This is going to be our dismissal. Um, the worship team will, choir will sing one more song as we, as we go. But I would like also to, invite, to ask that some of the prayer partners would come and make themselves avail available here as others are being dismissed. If you would like someone to pray with you personally, there'll be people who will do that for healing, for forgiveness, for maybe starting that relationship with Jesus or returning to him. Like we talked about earlier, feel free to come while others are going. And it's just been wonderful to join with you on this, on this Independence Day weekend to say, Lord, help us to be your church. Help us to be your people in this wonderful nation that we are a part of, yet that is so desperately in need of you. So thank you. As you we'll be back to our regular schedule next week, uh, 9 o'clock and 1045. I'll be continuing my, my series on the kings and important life values, but uh, invite you to, uh, to just remember not just one service next week, we're back to our regular service schedule. Thank you all who have joined us online, many of you here live, thank you. May God bless you, may you go in the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God, and may you walk in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit as you leave here today. God bless you. my day